gang fam how are you it's great to see you um i just wanted to make this quick video today to talk about well not really talk about how about tell a story about a man that i met many years ago now many um a great author uh, his birthday is actually today and i wanted to talk about uh the, the meeting that we had and i actually found a paper that he wrote about our meeting so i would like to read that story to you now um, glasses. I do look a bit weird with that, but whatever. All right, the true and indisputable facts in the matter of the ram's skull. This document is reproduced exactly as found. The date, October 2nd, 1849. My first encounter with the gentleman who, for his own purposes of anonymity, preferred to withhold his full name from the company and went simply by the sobriquet of the doctor was scarcely five hours ago when at the behest of two other doctors of my acquaintance, Parsons and Wolfson, I had found myself entering the house of a certain Mr. R, a scholar and man of letters of whom I was cognizant, but whom before this very evening I had not met. On the journey to Mr. R's house, I attempted to ascertain from the good doctors the purpose of our visit, but both were taciturn in the extreme, expressing upon me that as a gentleman familiar with the unnatural and the bizarre, it was to be something of a learned witness to tonight's events. Before I could correct their impressions of me, we were at Mr. R's residence and we alighted from the cab. We were shown into a parlor by a servant who thenceforth made himself absent, and I was introduced to our host, Mr. R., a rather unremarkable gentleman possessed of a pale, insubstantial complexion with thin hair plastered back across his pate, who gave every impression of being a nervous of hysterical nature, which did not predispose me well to the evening." Also in the room, on chairs and sofas or else standing by the curtained windows, were a number of other people. The two doctors and I were introduced to the gathered company, which struck me as being of a very disparate composition. Miss Allardyce, a stern and somewhat matronly woman, and her young female companion, Abigail, a plump, sullen, and charmless girl, possibly only just of marriageable age, 14 years old at the very most, and Colonel Kane, a veritable model of the military classes with a florid complexion and a most pugnacious air about him, who, barring his name, had said very little since our arrival, and he was sipping from a glass of cognac, grimacing. But I was most interested in the trio who stood at the window, an elderly gentleman and two younger people, a man and a woman. Although the first seemed comfortable, if somewhat impatient, his companions looked sadly lost or perhaps just bored. I introduced myself to them. The younger was Mr. N. Chesterton and his companion, perhaps his fiancée, or perhaps the elderly gentleman's daughter, Miss Barbara Wright. The other gentleman introduced himself simply as the doctor, which elicited an expression of knowing disbelief from Miss Allardyce. As I asked him how they came to be there, he turned his gaze on me and gripped his lapels in the manner of a school teacher about to embark upon a preemptory lecture. We received a message from a friend of ours, he said sharply, eyeing me with a curiosity that was somewhat disquieting. 
asked him if we had previously met, but he smiled a most disarming smile and shook his head, saying that although he had not yet had the pleasure, he was fully acquainted with my works. I was on the point of questioning him, of attempting to ascertain further his provenance, when Mr. R gave a short cough and we all turned our attentions on him. He was standing in the doorway to the back room, his arms extended to hold out of the way the heavy brocade curtain that covered the door with the clear implication that the evening was about to begin. The doctor seemed strangely reluctant to pass through. If I may ask, he said, addressing Mr. R, are we to be informed of the nature of this evening's uh, entertainment? At this, Colonel Kane bridled audibly, letting out a disgruntled snort. Entertainment, sir. Entertainment? I can assure you this is no evening of entertainment. My apologies, replied the doctor. The friend who secured our invitation for the evening was, shall we say, less than forthcoming about the purpose of this gathering. I am merely curious, that is all. Miss G was less than forthcoming, interjected Mr. R, because I have had to be very circumspect in my description of this evening, doctor. I apologize for what may seem like excessive secrecy, but what I hope we will achieve here tonight is not something that I would wish to be disseminated to the public at large. At his words, I felt a cold hand grip my spine and my eyes darted toward the still closed door to the back of the room. The doctor nodded thoughtfully, and in a silence somewhat thickened by Mr. R's pronouncement, we all proceeded through, myself leading the way. The windows had been draped with heavy velvet curtains, and a fire that had been burning in the grate had been extinguished, leaving the air smoky and gray. A circular table topped with a dark baize cloth filled most of the room and around it were ranged enough chairs for the gathered company. But what drew my and no doubt the others eyes was the object that Mr. R had placed in the center of the table positioned carefully on a small dais of dark wood. It was a skull a goat skull, I first thought, although Mr. R corrected Miss Allardis when she too commented on it presently, informing us all that it was the skull of a ram. The bone was a pale and sickly ivory color, bleached and unnaturally clean. The yellowish light from the three wall lamps stationed around the room glimmered softly on it, revealing a sheen that suggested that the skull had been polished dare I say it, lovingly, over many years. Dark ribbed horns curved and twisted out from it, their tips resting upon the cloth. Those awful, empty sockets surrounded by raised ridges of sharp bone gazed up at us, and even the residual warmth from the extinguished fire was insufficient to keep a sudden chill from clawing at my bones. Inscribed precisely between those sockets in the flat of the forehead was a clearly recognizable symbol, a five-pointed star, a pentagram, that most ancient of occult devices. Being the first into the room, I had the opportunity to observe the reactions of the other participants in tonight's entertainment, as the doctor had put it. The colonel gave the skull a most cursory glance, and I wondered briefly if perhaps he had seen it before. Indeed, it was possible that he had supplied it to Mr. R. I knew little of the colonel, although I had heard of him by reputation. He was a stalwart of the Long Ridge Club, where rumor had it he often held court at tedious length about his African hunting trips and expeditions to Egypt, so it was quite plausible that this skull had been one of his trophies. His cognac glass still in his hands, the colonel sat down heavily in one of the chairs as Miss Allardis and her ward entered. 
whilst Miss Allardyce seemed clearly disturbed by the animal remains. Her hand flew to her mouth in a somewhat parodic gesture, at which I had to stifle a laugh. The child stared at it in what I can only describe as awe. There was certainly something ghoulish in the way she was drawn to it, her chubby fingers pawing at the thick cloth on the table. Mr. R. was standing further into the room, watching with a fascination equal to mine the reaction of Abigail. Her mouth fell slightly open, her fat pink lips glistening with saliva as her bright eyes darted around, drinking every detail of the macabre exhibit. She was only cut short by Miss Allardyce, who whispered curtly that it was rude to stare and pulled her around the table to their seats. Next into the room were the doctor and his entourage. I noted with interest that whilst Miss Wright and Mr. Chesterton were drawn to the table and the skull exchanging oddly disturbed glances, the doctor himself seemed more concerned with the environs. He strode silently around, his thumbs tucked into the pockets of his vest as he examined the dimmed chandelier that hung above the table. I watched him as he took a few steps backward and seemed to be attempting to peer under the tablecloth. Then it occurred to me that this doctor was anticipating some sort of charlatanism on the part of Mr. R and was searching for signs of whatever artifices he imagined our host was anticipating employing. But when he did finally examine the skull and its inscribed symbol, a curious expression crossed his face as if at the recollection of some dim and distant memory. He tapped his upper lip with his finger and then shook his head sharply before seating himself alongside his companions. Dr. Wolfson and Parson, Parsons followed them and exchanged an uncertain look, whether it was an acknowledgement of a shared secret or a shared suspicion, I could not be certain. They joined the other guests at the table, leaving only two chairs for myself and for Mr. R, who took his place after he had passed around the room, dimming the lights and placing a lit candle ensconced with an elaborate brass candlestick entwined about with ivy leagues upon the table. In silence, he completed the circle, proceeding clockwise around it, Abigail, Miss Allardyce, Colonel Kane, the doctor, Miss Wright, myself, Mr. Chesterton, Dr. Wolfson, Mr. R., and Dr. Parsons. I caught a twinkle in the eyes of the doctor. Very atmospheric lighting, he commented dryly. I take it we are supposed to hold hands? Not at all, doctor, said Mr. R. All that is required is that you keep your attention on the skull on the table. I smiled to myself at the thought that at this moment it seemed unlikely that anyone's attention was anywhere other than the skull. In the dim lamplight, its cavernous socket seemed to gaze balefully at me, and I wished I had chosen my seat more carefully so that I should not have fallen under its countenance. Focusing our psychic energies, the doctor murmured thoughtfully, although he spoke so quietly that it was possible that I had misheard him. Perhaps, Mr. R., this might be a good time to tell us what exactly is supposed to happen. Have we come all this way for nothing more than a seance? Mr. R. gave a gentle chuckle. <laughs> this is considerably more than just a seance, he replied. Miss Allardyce's ward has what I believe is sometimes referred to as the gift. Second sight, with her help, we shall bridge the gulf between this plane of existence and the next. At this, there was an irritated sigh from Mr. Chesterton, but Mr. R. continued as though he had not heard. My intention is that she will discover for us the ultimate secret, revealing to us knowledge that only those who have passed on can know. The ultimate secret, doctor. Immortality. 
Mr. R's eyes glimmered in the dim light, and again I felt a cold hand press against my heart as though attempting to still its beating. The doctor's expression remained fixed, although I sensed a certain grimness, as if this were not the first time that he'd been in such a situation. Then it is a good thing that I am here, he said with an air of finality. The room fell silent again, and the other guests turned their attentions back to the skull. As the seconds passed, a palpable and altogether unpleasant change came over the room. The air around us, which had previously been still and warm, abruptly dropped in temperature, as if someone had silently thrown open a window, and yet, as far as I could perceive, there was no attendant draft of air, and the pale, oily light from the lamps stayed as hesitantly constant as it had been before. I felt a dryness in my throat as illuminated from the side, a thick, milky cloud issued forth from Mr. Chesterton's mouth. For one moment, I wondered if this was what I had heard of or referred to as ectoplasm, but I realized with some relief it was merely his breath condensing in the increasing cold. I saw that Mr. R was staring at me and drew my attention back to the skull. As the seconds ticked by in silence, I'm ashamed to say that I began to feel somewhat disappointed. True, the drop in temperature had been dramatic and unsettling, but since then, nothing had happened. Should we be thinking any particular thoughts? Came the whispered and dare I say it mischievous sound of the doctor's voice suddenly, followed by an impatient touch from one of the others, quite possibly the colonel. Please, doctor, said Mr. R, if you would be so kind as to keep looking at the... Mr. R suddenly stopped. Looking back on the moment when his words were cut dead, I can remember nothing other than a vague sense of irritation that he had been not finished his utterance. It seems I was, regrettably, the only person to be unaware of the circumstances that had caused him to finish mid-sentence, perhaps due to the fact that, yet again, my attention had wandered from the skull to Mr. R. himself, whose eyes were gleaming wetly and maniacally. At his words, I followed his gaze back to the skull on the table. At first, I thought that the dim light, the atmosphere, and perhaps a degree of mesmerism were combining to induce some sort of hallucination, for something most peculiar was happening to the remnants of the unfortunate and long-dead creature before us. In the depths of the shadows that nestled in those dreadful hollows, something moved. A gentle and writhing, sinuous motion as worms rising from damp soil. Each socket seemed possessed of things alive, and I heard a gasp from Miss Wright, who, from her seat at my side, could clearly see the same things that I could. I broke off from the skull and let my eyes wander across the shattered faces of the other guests. All but the doctor, which hardly surprised me and Abigail were staring fixedly at the skull. She was looking from one to another of the assembled group, her eyes wide and searching as if looking for some particular reaction, some specific response to the horror unfolding before our eyes. I had a sudden and inexplicable urge to pull away, to stand, bring up the lights and fling wide the curtains, but it was as if the very air had at that moment solidified and congealed, holding me in its frigid grasp as it insinuated writhing tendrils of darkness into my marrow. I found I was unable to breathe, my chest bound tightly as though by a huge unnatural hand and a tingle as from a galvanic battery was playing upon my skin. Curiously, I realized I could smell roses. 
doctor, came a hoarse whisper from Miss Wright. I tried to turn my head, but I was held immobile by the force that had taken possession of us. All of us, with the notable and somewhat unnerving exception of Abigail, seemed transfixed. The girl's pale, round face was illuminated by something which appeared to emanate from within her, a paradoxically wan, lambent radiance, and I was brought to mind of a full moon. As I gazed at her, she opened her mouth in a voice that I can only describe as unearthly issued forth, bubbling as though being transmitted through the medium of some viscous, oily fluid. The door is open, she said. Her lips twisted into the most horrific parody of a smile that I have ever had the misfortune to see, and the foulness of her visage was compounded by the fact that she was no more than a child, although at that moment she had clearly left childish innocence far behind her. Proceed, spoke up Mr. R. No, this from the doctor, who, against all the outward indicators of his frailty, had somehow managed to turn his head against the diabolical force which held us. He was staring at the girl, his jaw clenching and unclenching, this must stop, he hissed through gritted teeth. What you're unleashing here is evil. Can't you feel that? This last phrase was almost grunted, as if I had not previously been convinced of the malevolent provenance of this evening's events. His tone would have most certainly convinced me. Whatever the girl was doing, whatever doorway had been opened, I was in no doubt that what lay beyond it was more than anything I ever witnessed before, totally and utterly inimical to us all. But my train of thought was curtailed by further changes. A new metamorphosis was overcoming the skull before us, as if in some bizarre way we were witnessing the reversal of time. As though the world itself were winding backward, the skull began to clothe itself in flesh. Soft and pallid, the tissue formed on the polished bone, oozing out as a liquid from the surface of the skull. Within those horrible sockets, the worm-like forms continued to writhe, unaffected by the transubstantiation that overtook the rest of the head, for a head is what, by degrees, it was becoming. No longer a naked skull, it now possessed a thick patina of pale flesh, quite unlike any flesh I have seen before. There was no intimation of blood vessels nor musculature, and I began to wonder whether this was merely some stage magic, perhaps a fluid or paste being pumped through the skull from beneath the table. Was that what the doctor had been searching for? But the fluid did not drip or pool as one might have expected. It followed the contours of the skull, flowing around it and encasing it in a macabre parody of actual flesh. I became aware, for the first time, of a sweet, sickly odor, not unlike that of decomposition, which grew rapidly stronger, mingling with the scent of roses that I had previously noted, until I felt sure that I would be ill. My stomach churned in protest as the stench formed a miasma, thickening and curdling around us. And then, of a sudden, the silence that filled the room was shattered by a gasp from Dr. Wolfson, and we all raised our eyes from the skull. He was staring at Mrs. Allardyce's girl across from the table from him. For a moment, I was unable to take in what my eyes beheld. My first thoughts were that my own eyesight was impaired or that the breathy clouds issuing forth from the company had obscured my view of the girl. Amidst the grunts and moans of horror, shock and disgust from the other guests seated around the table, I realized that I was not mistaken. As though some sickening exchange were taking place, 
even as the flesh grew and crept upon the skull of the ram, Abigail's previous round and uncharitable though it may be to say so, fat face was becoming thinner, visibly so as we watched. Her jaw fell slackly open with a noise like that sound of tearing paper. Her eyes had rolled back into her skull so that only the whites were visible, and from within her dark and now cavernous mouth a moan the like of which I would never have believed possible issued forth. And to compound this ghastly sight, somewhere behind her tongue, dark and sinuous shapes writhed. I looked down at the ram's head. Now it was fully clothed in pale flesh. Curiously, there was none of the hair that I might have expected, and the eye sockets no longer held those worm-like forms. Instead, a single glossy black sphere filled each cavity, featureless and cold. They were staring at me. My attention was suddenly drawn to the figure of the doctor who had placed his hands upon the surface of the table and who was in the process, labored and painful, of levering himself from his seat. The tendon stood out on his neck as he exerted what I imagine must have been an incredible force for a gentleman of his age in order to extricate himself from the power that held the rest of us as flies trapped in amber. Inch by agonizing inch, as the rest of us looked on, he rose from his seat, shaking and unsteady. Beads of glistening sweat stood out on his pale forehead, and I could plainly hear his stertorous breathing. I cast my eyes about the room. The colonel wore an expression of utter fear, and I suspected that his adventures had little prepared him for something like this. The doctors, Parsons and Wolfson, too, looked on in terror, and I caught Parsons' eye for a moment before he returned his gaze to the skull, unable to turn his head to see Abigail seated at his side. The girl's face was by now little more than the head of a cadaver, almost fleshless, the surprisingly sharp cheekbones now protruding from the parchment skin that clung to them, taut and smooth. Her mouth was still open and those worms still crawled within it, flicking around her lips as if tasting the air. Her eye sockets were dark and empty now and a foul fluid dribbled from the apertures down over her cheeks like glistening tears of decay. Do not interfere, old man, came the rumbling voice from within and I sensed, as perhaps we all did, that Whatever a vile abomination had possessed her had realized that its hold was more precarious than it first believed. If indeed this was some demon or spirit from the netherworld attempting to gain a foothold in our realm, then the doctor clearly intended to prevent it. With jerky, spastic movements, the doctor's hands moved across the table to where Colonel Kane had deposited his cognac glass. Still, I noted with some grim amusement, half full. In one swift moment, he caught up the glass and threw its contents over the ram's head. You will not succeed, the girl said gutturally. My reincarnation is almost complete. In these last words, there was a note of triumph which sent my spirit sinking, plummeting away, and indeed I wondered how soaking the ram's head in the colonel's cognac could avail us to aught. To my knowledge, cognac was not one of those substances such as garlic and salt, which are said to prove inimical to demonic forms. The candle, Barbara, grunted the doctor, his eyes darting between his companion and the elaborate candlestick no more than a foot from her hand. To my amazement and to Miss Wright's great credit, she managed to speak through the tetanus, which must surely have gripped her jaw. I can't move. My heart sank at the helplessness that had descended upon us, and then, to my great surprise, I found a strength within me which I had previously little suspected. 
as like a light coming on in my brain, I realized the doctor's plan. I found myself moving almost without thinking, which perhaps explains my ability to move at all. And through no pushed my hand across the table, it contacted with the broad ivy wound base of the candlestick, knocking it over. A pale nimbus of bluish light sprang up where the flame had made contact with the spilled cognac, which in an instant raced across the intervening inches to the head and thence engulfed it, wrapping it in a flickering blue corona, curiously more intense than I would have imagined. It was as though in a manner somehow more symbolic than literal, the flames were driving back whatever demon was attempting to invade this plane. The pressure which had pinned me in my seat lifted and I heard a chorus of sighs and imprecations from around me as the others likewise felt themselves released. But amidst those imprecations came a low animal moan which rapidly built to a shriek. Abigail rose in her seat as if elevated by invisible strings and we all saw that her face, now little more than a skull beribboned with tattered shreds of purulent flesh, was likewise a flame. Yellow and blue it burned, spitting and sizzling like fat in a frying pan as the poor, poor girl stood motionless, her mouth wide. The unearthly fire engulfed her head, the hair and lips and eyelids peeling back as blackened and shriveled and added their substance to the conflagration. And yet, most chilling of all, she made no further movement and no effort to extinguish the flames. Like a wax dummy, she stood rigid as the flames spread rapidly down over her shoulders, igniting her dress and dents across her chest and down her arms. In God's name, cried Dr. Wolfson suddenly, shattering us all from our reveries. He attempted to rush around the table to the girl's aid, hopeless though it seemed, but he was stopped in his passage by the doctor who gripped his arm to hold him back. I caught something of a look transpire between them and Wolfson shrank back, his face clearly betraying his shock at the doctor's apparent callousness. In a shameful mutual silence, we watched the still burning corpse of Miss Allardyce's ward topple forward onto the table before it rolled aside and thumped sickeningly to the floor. On the table, the ram's head, charred and crisped, suddenly burst, spattering us all, and myself in particular, with the foul-smelling flesh that lay beneath the blackened skin. Copious cognac, its connotations did not go unnoticed, was passed amongst the remaining guests as we sat or stood in the dining room. Mr. R. had lent me a change of clothing, which, despite being somewhat less formal than my own had been, was gratefully received, although I still imagined I could detect the stench of that room and of the skull's vile flesh clinging to me, and I felt almost disappointed that the heady rose scent that I had previously smelled was no longer in evidence. Miss Allardyce sat sobbing in a corner, as the colonel attempted, with little visible success, to comfort her. The doctor, Miss Wright, and Mr. Chesterton had abstracted themselves to one corner and were muttering in low, conspiratorial voices, not so low, however, that I could not hear them. So we came here to watch a young girl die, did we? Miss Chesterton. We came here to prevent something something evil from gaining a foothold on this world. The doctor sounded stern as though repeating a lecture he had given many times before. But she was just a girl, doctor, said Miss Wright, her voice choked with incipient tears. The doctor nodded sagely. A very gifted girl, Barbara, or a very cursed one gave a shower shake of his head, and for a moment his eyes caught mine, and I looked away. If Mr. Poe hadn't summoned up such strength and courage, I had no doubt this last was for my ears, and I felt strangely grateful and humbled. 
then I imagine that poor girl's substance would have been used to rebuild the ram. Yes, I imagine that's not far from the truth. The ram, or at any rate, whatever the ram was to become, would have reconstituted itself, acting as a vessel for whatever force was possessing the child. He shook his head ruefully. And thank goodness we managed to sever its connection to this plane, to drive it back where it came from. Mr. R. had, it seemed, spoken to Miss Allardis, although I was not privy to their conversation. It appeared that some agreement had been reached between them regarding the story that they would tell to the police. No doubt some concoction regarding an accident with a candle... But what else, I ask myself, could be said that would not result in our immediate removal to a sanatorium? That we had been party to an attempt to gain the secrets of the dead? That before our eyes we had almost witnessed the materialization of some unimagined evil? In numb silence, we all bade our host good night, having made our own compact never to speak of this again. As I stepped out into the cool night air, refreshing after the grim atmosphere within, the doctor and his companions passed me and bade me a good night. You have a great talent, Mr. Poe, the doctor said with a smile. One day, I suspect, the world will rate you more highly than you may imagine. He leaned forward as if to shelter his words from others' ears. But a lighter touch with the prose wouldn't go amiss. He smiled tightly and curiously, somewhat sadly, and turned away, leaving me wondering quite what he'd meant. I watched them go, feeling tired and leaden, and then re-entered the house to bid my farewells to the colonel and Mr. R., who expressed his desire that his name, and oddly that of Miss G, be withheld from any account of this evening that I should choose to write up before I return to my rooms through the damp October air. I have, it must be noted, often been described as having a fevered imagination, but I could not drive from my mind the image of that poor girl standing before us like some ghastly human torch whilst the skull burned and sizzled on the table in front of us. And had it been the candle's flickering light, or had the pentagram inscribed upon the skull glowed momentarily before it had been obscured by its unearthly flesh? So it is done, and I have committed the events of the past few hours to paper. It is past midnight, and my story is complete, and yet I continue writing as if Somehow my continued existence depends upon the incompleteness of my tale. As I pinned the final paragraphs of the account above, it seemed that the shadows were gathering around me, waiting for me to finish, perhaps to pass some critical judgment on my story. I would like to believe that it is simply the horror that I have witnessed this evening that causes me to be so afraid of Every dark cranny in my room, every movement that I see from the corners of my eyes. I had hoped that the transcribing of my tale would be, what an apposite phrase, a form of exorcism for the demons that seem to have clung tenaciously to me since I left Mr. R.'s house. But quite to the contrary, it is as if that oppressive demonic presence is here with me now. And although I know not for what reason I am possessed of the unshakable belief that the shadows around me are pleased, oh horror, that I have put down this account. Perhaps, as I have oft times suspected, there are other gateways, other means of egress into our world of evil. And now that I have thought it, I am sure that I am right that simply through the medium of my words I have somehow accomplished that which Mr. R. failed to do. Whatever doorway to hell that the doctor sealed shut with the burning of the ram skull has been opened again through the scrawls on the paper before me. About me the shadows dance and writhe as if in triumph. The door, Lord save us all, is open again.
Edgar Allan Poe was found in the streets of Baltimore, disoriented and ill, on the afternoon of October 3rd, 1849, and taken to the Washington College Hospital, where he died on October 7th. The cause of death still remains a mystery, although the Baltimore Clipper described it as a congestion of the brain. Following Poe's burial, a mysterious stranger, still unidentified, visited his grave and left a bunch of roses and a bottle of cognac. This document appears to be the last thing Poe ever wrote. Edgar Allan Poe. Rest in peace.